Thank you very much, and uh, thank you, Bill, for inviting me to come down here. Today, what I'm going to talk about is innovation, opportunity, and value creation. And before I do, let me uh, provide some color commentary on uh, my biography. So I think it might be interesting for you guys as uh, students here to see how myself as a student uh, 18, 19, 20 years ago uh, eventually got to my current position. So I, I went to a public university such as yourself. I had a degree in computer science but also in history. Uh, graduated in 1988 and uh, first job out of college was with a software company at the time right now it's pretty large Oracle Corporation they make Oracle uh, they make the Oracle database a relational database but at the time it was about uh, 250 500 million dollar company so it was a medium-sized company growing really fast in Silicon Valley and that was the first time I'd really come out to California and with uh, both a history degree as well as a computer science degree uh, I went into more of a marketing role uh, kind of a technical marketing role and uh, I, it was a good role, but I realized, at least at a very uh, technology savvy and strong company such as Oracle, I needed to get more uh, technical. I didn't, I didn't want to be a programmer. Um, and so I actually got out in the field doing customer implementations. And I think that was a great experience uh, for me as just a few years out of college, actually going on customer sites, representing Oracle, uh, and actually being responsible for going in and installing software, configuring software, doing troubleshooting as well. But one of the things about the Bay Area and California as a whole uh, is that there's just a strong sense of entrepreneurism there. And I really didn't have that bug per se coming out of uh, the Univers University of Michigan. And uh, just wanted to get a good job out of college, probably much like yourself. But when I got there uh, at Oracle, it was just you know, Oracle itself was growing at the time like a rocket ship. It went from 250 million to 500 million to a billion to two billion dollars when I was there. I didn't have anything to do with it, by the way, but uh, it was it was incredible being in that growth environment. And you just and you, and people were leaving Oracle who had been there six, seven years in the beginning, going off and forming their own companies. And there are companies such as Siebel Systems that is, is now right now being acquired by Oracle, but people like Tom Siebel was at Oracle. And there's a, there's a whole host of other uh, people that have left Oracle and, and, success, and, and built successful big software companies as, as well. And so I got that, uh, that bug and flu, and um, a lot of headhunters were calling for people to start you know, other companies. And so I hooked up with a small startup company called Ecosystem Software, where for the first time I got into sales. I was the systems engineer, or sometimes known as a pre-sales consultant. Mm -hmm. And so that was the first time I ever got exposed to the sales process. And that was a lot of fun, because now I was in front of customers selling, leveraging some of my technical background. Actually, technically, I was the manager of systems engineer, but I was the only systems engineer right there. So I had the whole country, uh, racked up a lot of frequent flyer miles as well. And ecosystems you know, really wasn't that successful. And we were acquired uh, for about $17 million by a very large software company based in Michigan called CompuWare. And, um, and they had high hopes for the product line that we were developing. And um, I was made manager of systems engineers. So for the first time, I was actually had to go out and hire people and build a team and uh, really worked my butt off there. And, uh, but the product wasn't doing as well as a CompuWare. And I had a lot of complaints about the product and the technology. So they made me in charge of product management, which is to actually define the features and functions as well. So that was a great opportunity to kind of get exposed to a new role. Before I was in more of a technical marketing, then a consulting role, then a, a sales role. And now I was actually in product definition role as well. Uh, but the people that helped form ecosystems, which I joined about six months into the, after the formation, so I really technically wasn't a founder of ecosystems, but I was one of the probably the first 10 employees there. Uh, a couple of us went out and formed a company called NetIQ. And because I had this mix of uh, different experiences and exposures uh, through my uh, first seven years um, out of college, um, I was made responsible for marketing and product management and tech support, kind of all the things that I had done before uh, previously. And so there was about four or five of us as the key core founders. Uh, of the team. And um, one thing that really happened was that we learned a lot as a core team at Ecosystems of what not to do. So you'll actually find in your career, and it may be hard to see it right now, but you'll actually find, you actually learn more from what not to do 
and, and some of your failures than actually learning from your successes. So, because you're motivated not to repeat those. Um, and NetIQ was very successful. So, uh, the company was formed um, in the 95, 96 time frame. Um, and we shipped a product in February 97. It, it was a software product um, around the uh, Microsoft space doing systems management, monitoring the health and performance and availability of, of uh, Windows-based operating systems and applications such as Microsoft Exchange. So we shipped the product in February 97, and two years later, uh, we actually grew the business to $21 million, and we went public in July of 99, just, and it was a great time to go public, and we were going public with all, I remember we were on the IPO Roadshow, and wedding dot, I think it was wedding.com was going public at the same time, so there was a lot of <laughs> fluff out there in terms of people going public, and you know, why can't you be like pets.com or something like that? People were saying, well, we're a real software company, and we were actually profitable. Um, and the company grew from 21 million to 50 million dollars. We started doing various acquisitions. And so by the time I left, after eight years, we had grown in eight years from zero million to 300 million dollars in revenue from a handful of people around a, a conference table uh, to 1,600 people. And, but it was time for me to move on, and then I joined a, a venture capital firm, uh, Mayfield. Mayfield's one of the top VC firms in uh, Silicon Valley. Been around 25, 30 years, and I, I knew someone there. Uh, Peter Levine, who was actually one of the founders of Veritas, uh, a large software company that was recently acquired by Symantec, and uh, joined as an entrepreneur residence. I had some ideas. I wanted to, to be a CEO at that point in time. Um, and I had some ideas, and I eventually formed uh, Centrify uh, in March of 2004. It was only an EIR, as they call it, just for a few months. And the key thing about forming a company is you have teammates to do that because no matter how smart an individual is, not to say that I'm smart or hardworking, uh, it really takes a team to help you know, build something. And we'll talk a little bit more about you know, building a team, et cetera. So what Centrify does is that we're in the security space. What we, what we try to do is allow uh, IT administrators to control who has access to what computers and what they can do in the network. We also facilitate uh, end users to actually have single sign-on. So if you're ever sick of having to log on multiple times to different types of computer systems, we help resolve that. So that's my only plug for Centrify right now. Uh, but we've raised $21 million in venture capital. Uh, we now have about 70 people in the company. We have about 30 customers. We shipped product about four or five months ago. So things seem to be going pretty well and having a great time. And so in some sense, this is my third software company. Definitely NetIQ was, was a very good success. And so hopefully I can do something with Centrify that approximates it. So that's kind of my background. I think maybe a couple key takeaways that as I was writing the slide deck that may be applicable to you guys is, first of all, um, I'm a big fan of public universities. It's, it's a great place to come from. So I remember I went to Oracle. There was a guy that came back to campus at Oracle, uh, I mean, to the University of Michigan who worked at Oracle. And you know, he really wanted to come back. So like nine months after graduating, he came back and did interviews right there. And, and uh, so I interviewed at Oracle and just because I had used the products before. But then when I joined Oracle, it was right in the Bay Area. And there was like people in the same class of me from Harvard, from Stanford, you know, from MIT. And I was like, oh, I just, you know, I'm this guy from a you know, Midwestern public school. But you know what, after a while, um, you know, those people put their pants on one leg at a time. So don't be afraid, don't be embarrassed, or you shouldn't be embarrassed. You, go, you guys go to one of the top schools uh, in California in the nation. And, uh, and it's really, in the end, when I, as a CEO, when I look at resumes, I, I look what, they, what people do from a professional experience. It's very rare that I actually look at what, their universe, what university they go to. And if they went to an Ivy League school or public, it, it, it doesn't matter. It, it really doesn't matter. Um, but you guys, uh, having spent the afternoon here, it looks like you've got an uh, excellent program right here. And, and, um, and I, I think you guys will be in a good position to kind of launch yourself from a career perspective. Also, from a career perspective, you know, people give you a lot of advice, and obviously I'm, you know, another person potentially giving you some advice right here, but it's okay to mix things up from a career, from a career perspective. It's good to work at a big company. Some people say, oh, I really want to work at a small company, but it's okay to work at a big company. I've worked at a couple big companies, and big companies are big for a reason. They do some things well that you can learn from. But it's also, you learn a lot from a small company. So as a, as a CEO of a 70-person startup company, 
I actually do right now look for people that have that mix of experience and exposure at both big and, and small. And I also look at people that d not necessarily have always had successes, you know. So, you know, if on your resume, you know, you, were, you were, did a stint somewhere and the company wasn't successful or you weren't ex successful, you don't be, don't be embarrassed. Don't, don't be afraid of, of that. Uh, because, you know, that ecosystem software, I just work so hard. I probably work harder than at anything in my life. And I wanted it so badly it to work out, but we just made some fundamental bad decisions through. And um, then we were acquired by a bigger company, and there were some good decisions and some bad decisions. And when, as part of the team that formed uh, NetIQ, uh, it was just like, we're not going to do that, we're not going to do that, we're not going to do that, we're not going to do that. I mean, that was the, kind of the, one of the key drivers in terms of our success was like, boy, we had made all these mistakes, and we definitely weren't going to do that again. I think another thing is, and this is my two cents, um, it's, you know, sometimes there may be, especially early on in your career or at, at, at universities, uh, you know, people say, well, you really got to be specialized, you really got to be experts and stuff as well. And yeah, that's, that's good, but I also think, I also, as a, as a hiring manager, but also as a, a person looking at my, back at my career, I never really specialized in anything. You know, if you look at my career, I'd probably never spent more than two years at any position. I was, I kind of see myself as a generalist, and, and I think um, if you're competent at being a generalist, uh, you can get far. Um, and so don't feel the pressure or necessarily feel the pressure and need to like devote yourself to one thing because sometimes devoting yourself to one thing can kind of put you in a bubble. And I also feel very strongly that having a diversity of background, education, interest can lead to innovation um, and different ways of thinking about things. I'll hopefully try to throw out some examples of that as well. But I mean, um, and then finally, I've, I've already mentioned the whole concept of a team, and uh, you know, throughout my career, it's always been a team effort. I've worked part of a team, and even forming this company, uh, the company wouldn't have gone anywhere if I didn't have some teammates, some co-founders of the company. And so one thing I think you can learn from a career perspective is kind of put yourself in a position to be thought of someone that either someone would want to join your team or they would, or people would want you to join your team. And it's not, that doesn't necessarily mean being like the most popular person or whatever, but it's, it's oftentimes mean being thought of as someone who's very competent and that, you know, when the, when the chips are down, this is the kind of person you want on board that, that will get the job done as well. And uh, so definitely any success that I've had from a career perspective uh, has been driven uh, in part by working in the context of a team, and that that is so critical. And and it all I mean, even if you look at, you know, Bill Gates, you say, well, Bill Gates, he built Microsoft, but there were people such as um, you know Alan Balmer that were part of that team that make that successful. I mean, so any exam, almost any example of you know big technology companies that became wildly successful. It was all as a team effort. Yeah, at the end of the day, there, there is one CEO, and sometimes that CEO is on the cover of Fortune or Forbes or whatever, and, and the media likes to talk about the cult of the CEO. You know, they kind of build up this cult of a CEO, and you know, what is Jack you know, Walsh or Walsh or whatever his name is at GE going to do or whatever, but it's really the executive team and, and the people you know, below it that are really you know, make or break a, a company. So with that in mind, let me get to the topic at hand, which is I'm going to talk about innovation, opportunity, and value creation. So let's first talk about innovation here. Uh, what is it? Well, you probably have your own definition, but innovation, uh, in my mind, is just new ideas. Um, you know, and then sometimes people ask, well, is innovation happening? And the answer is, you know, heck yes. Um, you know, there was some recent announcements about breast cancer, you know, stuff going on stem, stem cell research. You guys, in hearing about what's happening here, it seems like there's some interesting innovation that has happened and is happening uh, here at UCSB. Uh, from a technology perspective, voice over IP, iPods, you know, who, who the heck ever, you know, thought of this? I mean, people thought of iPod, uh, having personal uh, systems to listen to music, but you know th this, it's amazing how you know uh, Apple's just selling you know millions and millions of iPods and the millions and millions of songs that have been uh, downloaded. And we'll talk a little bit more about the different types of innovations that at least from I see. You know, but innovation is critical um, to our economy. And so I grew up in the Detroit area in the 80s, and so I know. 
every decade or so, there's just all those challenges that are happening out there. And, and probably one of the big challenges that you have as technical people is you hear about, you may even see the, the, the challenge and threat that, that is out there to the U.S. economy in terms of India and China having very skilled labor that's much cheaper than potentially uh, people in the U.S. Um, and you know some people may get doomish and gloomish about that as well. Uh, growing up in Detroit in the early 80s and late 70s, I mean, it was depressing there, big time. I mean, it was just the automobile industry was just completely getting walloped. Um, and, you know, it was like how the U.S. has lost its edge and, and all that stuff. So every generation is going to have its different set of challenges. The key things, uh, at least in my mind, are not only uh, that, that will make the U.S. economy successful in, in any countries, it's, it's not only, it's basically not only the ability to innovate, but actually turn those innovations into ventures that, that create value. And I think as long as the, the United States can continue to come up with ideas, actually turn those ideas uh, into uh, ventures that uh, create value, then we'll be okay no matter what kind of the underlying economic challenges are. So I see really two flavors of innovations. The, the first one is a big bang, you know, just some amazing idea that just people haven't thought about that is pretty mind-blowing. There are not too many of them. You know, E equals MC squared, you know, theory of relativity. That's a big bang right there. Uh, but most of the innovations that are occurring uh, are more incremental, kind of building on each other. So uh, most of you obviously were through the dot-com in high school or before in the dot-com, and boy, there's this huge explosion of the internet. But that was built on 15 or 20 years of incremental innovations that all of a sudden ex accelerated. So most innovations out there uh, that occur, i.e. most ideas, are really incremental. And it's okay to have incremental ideas, to build companies around incremental innovations, because most, that's where most of the ideas and most of the ventures are formed. You know, Microsoft did not have the original idea for the personal computer operating system. They weren't even the first person to really come out with a graphical user interface. It was, what, Xerox PARC, and then Apple, and then finally in 1995, Microsoft came out with Windows. But, you know, look at, so Microsoft is oftentimes knocked as not being, you know, the first to market, uh, but, and kind of providing incremental in innovations, but they're very successful. So uh, one thing is if you decide to eventually, and you don't have to have that entrepreneurial bug day one. I mean, it may eventually, it's not okay, you know, if you don't want to do it, that, that's fine. Uh, but if you eventually do catch the entrepreneurial bug, you want, you have some ideas that you think would be great products, etc. Uh, at least in my mind, it's always okay to dream up a better widget. Nothing wrong with that. You don't have to change the world. Um, you know, you don't have to worry about, like, the next, next big thing, because you can actually be very successful, build a very fulfilling venture, um, add value to society, the economy, your family, your friends, uh, et cetera, by coming up with a better mousetrap, uh, as opposed to inventing the mousetrap uh, from scratch. So in, I'm familiar with the software industry. I, m many of you probably are not in, in computer engineers or computer science uh, majors uh, right here, but some of the analogies I'm going to give are in the software industry, and that most startups that form in the software, they're not out to build a platform. Uh, by a platform, it means like this kind of ubiquitous system or application where everyone builds on top of you. Uh, for example, uh, there was a pen-based um, system called Go a number of years ago. They tried to build a platform which everyone would kind of build around. They were not successful. Uh, but most uh, startup companies are out there are just trying to provide incremental value and building on top of a platform. So one area, which is the area that I'm in, which is security software, there's been hundreds of companies have raised hundreds of millions of dollars, and most of what they're trying to do is patch and address underlying problems in the operating system, making the Windows platform more secure, less vulnerable as well. So again, uh, innovations um, are incremental. Most innovations are incremental. And most of them are just trying to make the existing world, the existing environment, the existing platform a little better. But uh, now you're saying, OK, great. Um, incremental innovation, OK, I don't have to boil the ocean. I don't have to change the world with my ideas. And so I've got two or three good ideas that I really want to, I think I can turn into a, a new company or new venture, et cetera. Uh, well, the reality of the situation is 
probably there's a 90 plus percent chance that those great ideas that you have in your head are not original. That there are really not that many unique ideas that, that pop up that, that have a long shelf life. So even in the case of a situation where you know, what you'll find is, and this happened in, in both of my three startup companies, within three to six months either way of me shipping and launching my product, that some other vendor announced basically the same idea, the same concept. So it's like that, uh, I don't know if you guys have seen Butch Cassidy and the Sundance skin where, where Butch and, and Sundance are being chased. They keep on looking back and say, who are these guys? And it's amazing that uh, people, if there's a problem out there that people want uh, ad addressed or the, there's a need out there, that other people in the U.S. or in other parts of the world are thinking the same idea. And they may not think exactly the same thing that you're doing. It may be with a slight twist. You may have two racing stripes down the center and they have only one racing stripe. Um, so that's another thing you just kind of have to deal with, um, which is the fact of the matter is, is that other people will have the same idea, and oftentimes that's revealed by simply doing a Google. But don't get disappointed about that. If you, you say all of a sudden, oh, I had this great idea for blah, 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 and then all of a sudden you go into Google and type blah, 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 and some company in Finland, a uh, five-person company is doing that. That's okay. Or it's also okay that some other, you know, Cisco is doing it, or Microsoft is doing it. That's okay. I mean, it may not be as good if Cisco and Microsoft are doing it, there still could, but there still could be an opportunity out there. Now, what if you go out there and it turns out no one's really thinking about it, and with the exception of like some guy in his basement in Germany, he has a shareware, freeware version, which has one-tenth the functionality of the idea or innovation you have uh, out there. Well, you also have to take into account that once you go out there, ship the product, get a lot of buzz, you start selling, that if it's really a good idea, a really good innovation, that someone else is going to look at you and say, that's a good idea, but they've kind of screwed up the implementation. I can actually take that idea and provide incremental improvement to it and deliver it with a new architecture, new platform. So in the case of, uh, let me give you some specific examples. Um, so historically, uh, for example, software has been uh, has delivered as a piece of software on a CD or download, you install it. And there were firewalls, for example, Checkpoint came out with a firewall that you installed on a system. And then there was a company called NetScreen that said, you know what, that's a great idea, but boy, that takes a lot of time to install the product, uh, et cetera. So they came up with the concept, and I don't even know if they're the first ones to come up with this concept, have a firewall and appliance. So you don't actually install something, you don't have to install something on a server, you just wheel an appliance, plug in the network, and all of a sudden you have a firewall. So, you know, so some people are always doing that. Now, it, there's another thing that's going on in the software industry, which is uh, software as a service. So, uh, for example, you know, Siebel, they weren't first to market as it relates to CRM software, customer relationship management software, but there's this company called Salesforce, salesforce.com, that's delivering CRM, but they're doing it with a, a model which is a hosted model, okay? So this is constantly happening that if you have a good idea, assume that people, other people will have the idea, and also assume that if it's a really good idea, that people will copy you and probably have a better implementation. But that's okay. I mean, it's okay if you're not the original person with the idea. Uh, if it's a good enough idea, you got the right team, uh, et cetera, you should potentially still pursue it, uh, even given that hurdle. And kind of one factoid is, especially in the software space, this may not be true of biotech or, or some other industries, but definitely in the software space, it's rarely the first to market is the market leader three to five years from now. So uh, when, the, uh, you know, when the internet was exploding, and I wanted to do searches six, seven years ago. I didn't use Google, I used AltaVista. That was, AltaVista was the place where you went to search, right? But who the heck uses AltaVista now? You know, Google wasn't first to market. Uh, obviously, some of you may recall, you know, the betas, Betamax versus VHS. Uh, you know, in the uh, network uh, directory services, there was Banyan Vines, and then there was Novell with NetWare. Netware, Novell just announced they're laying off 10% of their company. 
uh, you know, they're struggling. They, but they were, Novell was number one, 90% market share in providing file and print servers. But Microsoft came along and was not first to market. They were really second or third as well. So it's, you know, so innovations occur all the time. Other people are thinking about the idea. It really kind of boils down to um, taking the innovation and actually putting it in, into a venture. So now, and we'll talk a little bit more about how you go about, you know, building a business out of an idea, you know. Now, one thing I think is really key to successful innovation is market research. So you've come up with this great idea, okay, which is great, and I, I want you guys to do that. And, and then you realize, yeah, there's a couple people out there doing it, and even though there's not someone else doing that, you know, Tom Kemp said that, hey, first to market doesn't necessarily mean market leadership three to five years. So should you immediately go out there and form a company and do something uh, about it? I would actually hold off and hold off and, and do some additional due diligence, which is actually get market validation. Figure out if the dogs will really eat the dog food. And that means in the, potentially in the enterprise software market or even in the consumer market, actually go out and talk to people. Talk to 10 to 20 customers about the idea. Now the problem with that is you do have to open up the kimono a little bit. Right? You've got to tell them about your idea to actually see if they're interested in that. Uh, but once you do that, you'll find out if the idea actually is a good idea. Now, it may turn out to be a situation where you talk to 20 people and they say, that's a crappy idea. You know, when, at NetIQ, when we visited Gartner Group, an industry analyst, they, they said it was a stupid idea. That's what they said about NetIQ. Okay, three years later, the, the analyst at Gartner who said it was a stupid idea apologized to me. He said he's wrong about that, which was nice. But we had talked to enough customers, and we actually weren't, weren't in our bubble. We were actually had talked to customers, and they said, you're onto something. Now, even if they say you're not onto something, then maybe abandon the idea or maybe have it evolve. So don't be afraid, once you have an idea, once you have an innovation, to evolve it. And maybe you're just doing, when talking to 20 customers, maybe it's still a great idea, and you really think it's a great idea, but maybe you're just explaining it wrong, okay? So step back and, you know, and think about it. But this is a good time, uh, you know, and, we, and there's a lot of startup companies out there that they really don't do a good job of market research and market validation to confirm whether or not what they're doing is a, is a good idea. And so, at the very least, doing the market research and market validation, you know, is a good idea. And don't be afraid to let your innovation evolve. And now what are some other keys to innovation, to ideas? And, you know, I, so I talked about, like, double checking to see if the, the uh, dogs will eat that dog food um, out there. Um, but also, you know, oftentimes people will go out and form ventures because they think, boy, this is a really neat idea. And what they're doing is kind of te selling technology for technology's uh, sake. And what's really key, especially in the software market, is coming up with a product that solves a real point of pain. That, and that it's really critical in the software industry, especially if you're going to sell to enterprises, less so to consumers, um, that it's, your product is a must-have solution. So you come up with this great idea, and you validate it, check what everyone else is doing, it. you feel very confident, and you've done the market validation, but you, don't be afraid to ask those potential customers that you're doing the validation, is this something, in the end of the day, would you really buy? Would you really spend money on? And you'll be afraid that a lot of people don't ask that question. You know, it's kind of tough to ask people for money, and even salespeople. You know, you have to you have to train salespeople to like say, you know, is it, you know, at the end of the day, will you really buy this? You just can't assume that they will. And so that's a key thing: was that you know, will you pay money for this? Ask that question. So another key thing about your innovation is that, okay, so granted, it, you know, maybe there's only two or three other people doing it. They're, they've got the wrong implementation. You think it's a great big market. Customers say it's must have. Be sure that you have some sort of secret sauce in your product or in your innovation. You know, step back and say, is this something where the bar is pretty high? Because the worst thing you want is you come up with a great idea that you validate with customers that people will buy it, but it turns out that any Joe Schmo can actually reproduce and actually you know, do your idea as well. So the key thing is step back and say, you know, what's the core intellectual property I have? Is the bar high? Is it something, what's my market edge that I'll have as I re release this product? But 
one of the, I think probably one of the most key things, again, kind of goes back to my team concept, okay, um, is that at the end of the day, uh, what make innovations, what, what, what helps flesh out innovations and what turn innovations into viable ventures is having a group of people that make it happen, that feed off each other, that have a kind of a common thread, common set of experience. Now, you may say to yourself, well, look, I'm not planning to form a company anytime soon, blah, 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 blah. That's fine. But even if you don't plan to form a company, you plan to jar join a larger organization, you know, you still want to be thought of as like someone that, hey, I want this guy around, right? And that doesn't, again, that doesn't mean being like the most popular, the guy that, you know, puts the shiny apples on your boss's desk or, you know, agrees to, to walk their dog or, you know, or babysit their dog over the weekend. You know, that's nice, but, you know, um, I, I think the key thing is, you know, put yourself in a position, be thought of as a very competent person that has their, their act together, that people would want you to be part of their team um, or would want to join your team because, Again, it's, it's very difficult for an individual to um, succeed in kind of isolation um, and by themselves. I mean, that success in, in, um, in a professional perspective is, is predicated mostly on uh, individuals working together as a team. Um, also, you know, one thing I, I hear and see is that sometimes people have this great idea and they get so fixated on it and, and you know what? you're going to have and, and other people are going to have multiple you know innovations in their life you know when I thought see I just really worked my butt off at, at this ecosystems software and just went anywhere and because I really thought this was going to be it I mean this is I'm finally in the startup I really want to make it work and I just like you know was just so into it and I was so you know the highs the highest of highs I was flying high and the lowest of lows I was just so depressed and all that stuff not medically or clinically depressed, but just bummed out. Um, but I didn't realize that, you know what, I, got, I didn't realize at the time, I got a couple more startups in me, you know, and, and I, didn't, I didn't say, you know, hey, don't let it worry you that much. So, so think in your mind, if you, if you are someone that's creative, that's someone that, that wants to innovate, that you'll have other innovations. So don't necessarily get wrapped around the wheel that it, this has to be it, right? And again, kind of going back to another point that I brought up before, which is some of the best innovations are based on stuff on your failures and the things that weren't successful. All right, so we've talked about innovations and uh, I'm definitely saying, go ahead, think, dream big, but uh, as, as you dream big, you know, do it with your wide, eyes wide open in terms of figuring out if other people have done it and figuring out um, you know, whether or not it's actually a viable you know, idea out there by talking to people, innovating, uh, et cetera. Now, you may want to make that leap to actually taking that idea and trying to commercialize it or bring it to market in some form. So in my mind, it's interesting. Venture capitalists say, you know, they say, this company is an interesting opportunity, right? And uh, so in my mind, opportunity represents actually taking the idea and trying to make a business uh, out of it. And, you know, the thing is in Silicon Valley, which is probably very true in here, here in L.A., is that there's thousands of ideas out there, but and much like there's thousands of movie scripts, right? But only a small percentage out there actually turn into movies or, or form companies. But uh, lucky, luckily for you guys and lucky for me, uh, we're in California where this is a great place that if you have ideas to actually turn those ideas into opportunities because this is where more companies, more companies get funded, there's more money put, uh, put into uh, startups than anywhere else in the, the world. So there's really two ways to go about taking your innovation and commercializing it, turning it into an opportunity. The first of which is bootstrapping it. And, and there's a lot of story, there's been a lot of successful bootstraps out there. And this is a good route to go um, if you're really not sure, if you're not 100% sure that this idea will really fly in the end. Um, so it's kind of a way to dig a tiny hole. And if you make a mistake, you can bury it and really not that much money has been spent. And it also works well kind of bootstrapping it, doing, yourself, doing it yourself or with a small group of people uh, in a slow to develop market where time is not of the essence and uh, a small amount of capital can stretch out a long way. And in fact, maybe the team can do some consulting on the side as you kind of build, build this up. 
and, and also works well uh, in markets where the technology bar is relatively low, so you can get something quick and dirty out in the market, gain some traction, kind of build from there as well. And probably one of the better scenarios um, in the, in the uh, down, going down the path of bootstrapping yourself is where you can get a customer basically to pay you for what's something that you eventually want to productize uh, out there. So in effect, a customer funds you. In fact, Oracle, uh, I believe their first project was the CIA. And so they, ca they maintained the rights uh, to that. And that's how Oracle got uh, jump-started. And if you're really conscious and cognizant of what percent of ownership of the company, uh, you know, the people that really make the big bucks uh, in terms of startups going public and being big are people that have done it, bootstrapped it themselves. Um, now, another thing, you, you may also be forced into a situation of having to bootstrap if you're really passionate about your, your idea, is that if you and your founding team members are not known commodities, uh, and what you'll find is in the second route to commercialize your innovation is, that, is the venture route. And venture capitalists are very much of the mindset that the first and foremost thing in their mind is they invest in people. Um, and they, with the thought process is people are the most important things of whether or not a venture will, will take off an innovation. Because there's so many innovations out there. There's so many business plans being pitched at venture capitalists. Uh, the first thing they look at is, hey, do these people have a, a successful track record? And there are friends of mine, there's colleagues of mine uh, that work for me or, or worked with me that you know, don't have as a successful track record in terms of being a senior executive. Maybe they were a manager or VP, but they've got a great idea. And they say, well, can you introduce me to some VCs? And you know, I sit down, I spend some time talking with them, I say, look, you know, to, in a VC's mind, you're kind of a risky investment because you don't have that track record. And so I oftentimes recommend people that, you know, prove them wrong. Go out there and actually show that your concept is a real opportunity and gain some traction in the market. In effect, bootstrap yourself and then come back and then investors will be very impressed with what you've been able to accomplish. Bootstrap has the kind of a negative element is that all the financial risk is typically with the actual entrepreneur. And you may not be able to attract, besides your kind of your core set of teammates that are friends of yours, or people you've worked with, uh, it may be a little bit riskier to go out there and, and uh, have other people hire because they may be you know, a little bit risk averse about going to a company that's not formally funded. But, but there's been a lot of successful uh, bootstraps uh, out there of uh, people taking ideas to market. Um, you know, Oracle was one, you know, Microsoft, uh, Dell, uh, et cetera. Uh, but there's another route, which is to go the venture funding route. And it allows you to go to market a lot sooner because you have more capital that you can actually uh, put into it. And it's also a probably a preferred route if you really need to get to market relatively quickly, which may be, which relatively quickly, we're not talking about three months, six months, we're talking about one to two years, or where the technology bar is much higher. So it's an ability to raise five, six, seven million dollars out of the chutes, and it allows you to actually build a prototype, maybe even get a product into beta uh, format, um, and so, and, and get further you know, validation uh, in the real world. Um, the nice thing about venture funding is, is that the money is mainly the VCs, and the VCs get their uh, money from limited partners who tend to be uh, large institutions like uh, endowments, uh, you know, Stanford, Harvard, they've got these huge funds, and they, they, they're the ones that actually give the money to VCs um, to go out and invest um, uh, the money on their behalf. Um, you know, having VC funding can make you more credible to potential employees and customers, and good investors will provide good, solid advice to you. Um, and the nice thing about if, if you have a good enough track record, um, oftentimes you can go out there and literally, you know, with not much firm or solid besides a PowerPoint slide deck and maybe some potential customer references of people who like the concept and your, yourself, that people will invest in in this idea, just little more than a PowerPoint slide deck. So in the case of Centrify, we formed the company in March, and we raised $7 million in June. We didn't have product. I couldn't say, let's see the demo. I couldn't even do that. Um, but that's kind of one of the, the, the nice things about VCs. But on the downside is that the venture capitalists, they 
own a significant chunk of the company. They probably, after your Series A round, they can own 50% of the company, half the company. Um, and so, which means that you're no longer a mom and pop outfit, and they'll expect results down the road. Now, VCs, you know, rightly and wrongly have a bad rap. You know, vulture capitalists, they do all these bad things. But there's a lot of great examples of venture capitalists that keep on putting money into turkeys <laughs> over and over, keep on funding them. Um, so, uh, but at the end of the day, you know, they now own a significant chunk of the company, and they want to see a return on investment. Um, and it takes a long time to go out and raise money. It takes months. I, I was very fortunate because I was affiliated with a venture capital firm that was able to raise money in three months. But most people, it may take six to nine months because take into account that the average VC firm of five, they have five to six, seven partners. They receive thousands of business plans. And in a given year, they only make eight to 15 investments or some number you know, like that. Um, so the odds are of you know, uh, of one of the business plans that come through the transom being funded is like less than 1%, much like the percentage of uh, movie scripts that get turned into movies is a similar amount as well. So what do VCs look for uh, in an opportunity? They look at for the team. They look at the people if they have a proven track record. They look for large markets that are out there where there's significant amount of customer pain, that the, i.e. the must-haveness is there. Um, and it's something that you know, customers, analysts can actually validate and say, yeah, actually, I would buy, if they come out with a product like this, I will spend money on this. Um, and then finally, it kind of goes back to this idea or concept of, that's great, you have a better mousetrap, but what's your secret sauce? You know, what is your barriers, what is the barriers to entry? And that could be having a significant amount of domain expertise, um, or it could be having patents or something like that as well. So those are kind of like the top three ingredients that in, in me talking with a number of VCs and being affiliated with a venture capital firm that I saw that what VCs are looking for. But oftentimes, other key factors in a VC's mind include the fact that the introduction, you just didn't cold call them up and say, hey, I, you know, can you invest in me? That they were referred to people that they know and trust and say, hey, Tom's a great guy. I'm going to go ahead and uh, you know, check them out. And oftentimes, VCs like to have the ideas and concepts, kind of things that they think that they thought of or have thought about before that, that uh, already fits into an exist existing thesis. And here's some other of the criteria that they have. So again, I hate to beat this to ho horse to death, but this is a key part of innovation. I mean, so at the end of the day, you, know, you talk about innovation, opportunity, uh, value creation. It takes a team. And um, you know, even Google, the two guys you know, at Stanford, you know, they came to the realization and their investors came to the realization as well that they needed a CEO to come in. They hired Eric Schmidt. Um, and you know, having a team always means compromises. Even if you're a team as part of a large project, even if it's a team you know, doing a project here uh, at the university, but from a, a startup perspective, you know, you know, having a team can often mean, like if you don't have a team, um, you may end up having 10 or 15 percent of something that may be worth a million dollars, or would you really ha have two or three percent ownership or stake in a company that's worth 100 million or 200 million dollars? So that, that's the trade-off there. And then finally, let's talk about value creation. Value creation, at least in my mind, you can have your own definition, is now that you've turned this innovation into a venture, that you, that that venture prospers in a way in which it creates value to a number of constituents. Now, typically, most people think, oh, value creation, you know, what's the market cap of that company? So that, that kind of goes to the actual shareholders themselves. But there can be value creation in terms of uh, employees. It was nice that I think after we got the initial core team at Centrify, like the first four or five people we hired uh, were actually looking for a job or they had just been recently laid off. It was in March of 2004. So I feel good about the fact that at Centrify, yes, we're only a 70-person company, that at least there was a 10 to 15 people that, you know, we became their, um, you, know, s you know, source of employment. Um, and that, uh, you know, hopefully we're building an organization where people get fulfillment out of. And um, also a nice thing about startup companies is that the employees get you know, share of the company. They get equity in the company as well. And so it's important to create value not only for the shareholders but the employees, also the community uh, as well, that to benefit the community, you can create value for that. 
Also customers. Don't forget about your customers in this whole equation that um, you want to be thought of and this will lead to uh, value back to your shareholders, your employees, uh, et cetera, is making your customers happy as well. And then finally, a key constituency in terms of value creation is uh, yourself. And, and don't forget the, the, the you part of the whole equation uh, right there. You know, try to aim to do things that make you happy. And, uh, and you know, it doesn't have to be, you don't have to be in a situation, you don't have to have your startup company go, pu or go public, or you don't have to be in a situation in which the large company that you join after school, you know, it, you know maybe the stock only goes from 51 to 52 in the three years you, you're there. You know, it doesn't have to be a commercial hit, like using that movie analogy. You know, a lot of movies, you know, leave their mark on people uh, even though they're not commercial hits. Um, and because in the end, you know, you're, all of you are going to be out in the workforce 20, 30, 40 years, et cetera. And so, you know, companies will come and go. You'll, you know, I actually, compared to most people, I think I've been at five companies in my 17 years or so, or whatever the number, actually 17 years out, outside of college. And that's actually on low. You probably be in 17 years or 20 years, probably most of you will be at 10 different you know, companies if you go out in, in the commercial world. So innovations and opportunities come and go, but you know, hey, there's only one you out there. So, um, and, and you know, hey, take it or leave it right here, but you know, I, I think it's really important to figure out what makes you happy and pursue that. Maybe you don't have to pursue that day one. And you know, when I joined Oracle, I didn't know really what, I, all I know is I wanted to get out of Michigan. It was cold there. Okay, that's what that was kind of a big motivation, and I thought California was a really cool place to, to go because it was warm. You know, not as nice as you know Northern California is not as nice as uh, Santa Barbara here from weather. But boy, I thought this was really cool. So that was kind of the big thing that made me happy was being warm. Okay, and then I got an Oracle, and you know I, what I found is what made me happy was, wow, there's all this innovation, entrepreneurism going on, and uh, I want to be part of that because it seems really fun and really exciting. But that's me. It may not be right for you. Um, and, you know, so you don't have to, you not necessarily, you know, day one, you know, figure out what you're happy and, and, and pursue. It may take you a little while, but, you know, along the way, you know, always set personal goals and objectives. And remember, you don't have to, you know, you know, there's that movie where they say, you know, don't put baby in the corner, right? You don't have to be put in the corner, right? It's okay. You don't have to specialize. A lot of people, you know, it's like that in the, the movie The Graduate, you know, plastics, you know, that's the, you know, you don't have to do plastics. You can do plastics for a year. You can do some other stuff. So it's okay to be a competent generalist out there. You can be very successful. And, you know, frankly, you know, time and time again, you know, when it comes to, you know, uh, decisions that I make or the, 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 the business that I'm helping to form right here, a lot of the thoughts and ideas didn't come from me focusing on that technology, but I grabbed ideas uh, from other things, uh, reading about politics or part of my history degree, the ability, and I, what's, a, what's a concrete example of that? You know, oftentimes engineers they're very good about spewing out features and benefits. Well, the T1000 has this widget, this, 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 and all that stuff. But what customers really want is the ability to like, well, what's the theme, you know, pro provide them a theme in terms of where this piece of technology fits in. And, you know, personally for me, kind of having the hist history background, I, th I felt it was very important for me to be able to put context around the technology that we're delivering and be able to position it. I mean, look at innovation, look at the iPod. I mean, that's not, it's, some of it's technology, but most of it's design, right? And so, and so the people that are really driving a lot of the innovation in Apple are the, 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 the designers of, of the technology, looking, looking at the ease of use, you know, what will, uh, you know, Susie in Ohio think about, you know, this design with the scroll pad? I mean, that's the stuff that they think about. So innovation can be sparked not necessarily from your specific field. So I definitely would recommend, you know, try to give yourself a wide range of uh, exposures to, to other things because you'll find that it can actually lead to other things. Um, Again, you know, I'm kind of not hitting, hitting this a number of times, but you have to realize that, you know, no matter if you go to a startup, a big company, a small company, you, you don't, or maybe if you go into a not-for-profit, 
that a lot of your personal professional success and happiness is going to be based on the people around you and you're dependent on those people to, to, to make yourself happy. And so realize that and open yourself up to working uh, as part of a team and being a good team player. Um, but again, it really kind of goes down to you know, competence um, and, um, and being someone that people respect for you know, what they can do. Uh, again, as I talked about before, don't be afraid to, to make mistakes. It happens. It's OK to take risk. Please do so. Uh, because you'll actually find if you don't take those risks, you may not learn as much. Um, and um, you know, I think uh, you're at the I think you're at the right place at the right time. There's a lot of exciting innovations going on. I mean, it's you know, people were really worried with the the dot com uh, you know implosion, explosion, and all that stuff. Boy, it's going to be really tough for companies to start up. And yeah, it's not like just all these crazy ideas being funded, the weddings.coms and the pets.com and all that stuff. But there's a ton of stuff happening. It's just amazing all the amount of innovation. It's just every day something new or something cool is happening. And I think California, you know, spending the billions of dollars that it will spend on stem cell, it's going to open up a whole amount of uh, research and innovation in that space. So, uh, so you, I, you guys are at a great place to be in. You know, I was in Michigan, and uh, it was cold. Um, and they didn't have a program like this where someone like myself could speak uh, as well. So definitely enjoy it while you can. And I always wanted to say this line, uh, but 80% of success in life is just showing up. So uh, if you want something, you got to show up uh, for it. And that's about it. So, uh, so I think the key thing about value creation is you know, creating value for yourself. All right, that's it. Let's have some questions. Thank you. I would like to ask you, <clears throat> how much should a CEO get involved into innovation? I mean, obviously it's important to get a very good product. On the other side, mm -hmm. somebody also has to run a business. And uh, in your experience, um, should there be a split of work or is it best if the CEO also heads the innovation process? Um. I think the key thing is putting together a team in which you, ha you pay have the best people for the individual roles. And so innovation uh, definitely, especially in the, in the initial days, should really be driven a lot by the chief technical officer, the VP of engineering, um, and maybe a few core developers uh, as well. And, um, but often, in some cases, the CEO is that that person as well. So it really depends on the team that you put together in terms of who's really driving the technical vision. But at some point, uh, it eventually becomes a situation uh, in which um, the CEO kind of has to do more of the blocking and tackling of running the business. And, it's, and there's often times what you'll see in Silicon Valley, like the technical guy uh, who has the idea, he'll be CEO. and. Uh, you know, he'll have the idea, he'll create the initial company, and then eventually at some point, you know, he gets replaced because he just doesn't have the skill set. He'll be a great technologist, but he won't have the skill set to actually go out, raise money, hire the sales organization, make sure, you know, the finance people are doing their things as well. So one of the classic frictions that occur are the situations where you have a technical founder that, you know, really in the end should not be the, the CEO of the company. Um, so. Really, the lines of division really uh, have to do with where you're at from a formation perspective, and having the right people in the in the right roles. And and you know, if you're going to hire a person to be a CTO, they should be the technical officer. They should be one of the prime drivers of, of the vision. Not to say that you work. That's it. Only Bob, the CTO, is the technical guy and all that stuff. It, it should be a team effort. But in the end, you should hire the people to do the job. So if you hire VP of sales, they should be really good at VP of sales, uh, and they should be have a good appreciation of the of the other components of the business. But in the end, that's the responsibility. And in the end, a good CEO, you know, should be responsible for the day to day running of the company, making sure it, it's executing on all cylinders. And the, the vision you know, of the company should be driven by the, the chief technical officer, the, the product manager, the VP of engineering, et cetera. Uh, so oftentimes just in startups, people kind of put themselves in roles that may be good 
for the short term, for the first year, uh, but in the end, they're not the right people for the right roles. And it's, you know, Google is a great example at that right period of time, they said, look, we need someone who has experience in running a big business, and they brought in Eric Schmidt. And that was, and that really probably in, in part helped uh, fuel uh, their growth by getting the right type of person for CEO and having those two guys be the technical visionaries. All right. Yes. Um, in your resume, you didn't mention any MBA or business school experience. Do you um, recommend that to us in this day of age, or do you wish you had taken those courses when you were coming out of school? Well, to each I, to each their own. Um, I actually thought I was going to work at Oracle for two years, and then you know go and get my MBA because a lot of other people were doing that, and. Um, and what I found was was that um, I was having a really good time working. I was learning a heck of a lot, and I got the entrepreneurial bug. And um, I actually took the GMATs, but my heart wasn't into it, so I did very poorly on the test. Uh, and and then I didn't really even seriously apply or do anything like that because in the end, by after being there at Oracle for two years, I wanted to be part of Silicon Valley. Wanted to be part of building something, and so uh, and I felt that. Uh, taking two years off would, you know, kind of, you know, kind of basically put some of the dreams that I had suddenly developed on hold for two years. Um, and so for me, um, it wasn't, uh, you know, it wasn't something that I did. I mean, I thought about it. Now, now some people, but that that's me. Um, and other people, they may have gotten a certain type of degree, and they may find themselves, look, I really want to get more business oriented. And that's the way to go about doing that because they may not have a path to kind of go into more business-related things, and so that getting an MBA may be may be really helpful. So, I think kind of the key thing is is that what you need to do as an individual, especially early in your career, is like literally every day or every month, ask yourself, are you learning something, and is what you're learning something interesting and exciting, you know, for you. Um, and, and is it getting to you where you want to go? And so you can, you kind of, you'll, in the end, you'll kind of know what that threshold is. And if it eventually drops below that threshold, then you should consider other things. But if you know, if you're in a situation, you get a great company, and every day you're learning something new, and it, it, it satisfies you and fulfills you, then um, then it may be a risk to like drop out of that and go to school. Uh, you know, to get, get your graduate degree. So it really depends on you know what what the goals and objectives you have. What makes you happy, um, and um, you know, so, so it's it's right for some people, you know. In, in the end, it wasn't right for me, and you know, and I I think I've learned a heck of, heck of a lot in terms of the real world, the school of hard knocks, um, than potentially going to business school. But that's me.